Hi everyone, thanks, thanks you all for coming here at this time. And uh, I'm going to talk about serverless with Python. I don't know, do I sound okay? Uh, the idea of this talk is to know a little bit about serverless, discover what does serverless mean, and then how to use it with Python. I'm not going to go into very depth into serverless, but to give a broad idea and some tools, some frameworks, and some ways to play with it with Python. There's a repo also. Uh, we will link it in the, in the slideshow. And so you can later play with the repo and test every code example that I'm showing here uh, at the warmth of your home and taking it uh, slowly and uh, learning a lot. So. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, would be what is serverless? Well, the first solution would be no servers. Well, probably serverless is the best uh, chosen marketing word because it doesn't mean no servers. Well, there are servers. At, at some level, there must be some servers, but a very, a most accurate uh, pre definitions would be functions as a service. That means that I'm executing your function, I'm doing some computation only on demand. Uh, you don't have to manage servers because there's a provider or there's another infrastructure that is managing the servers. You only care to create code of your functions and to upload it. Once it's uploaded, it's a task of the provider to run your code, to run that computational power. So it's a way of seeing it. You may think, well, that concept is not new. We had a platform as a service, like Google App Engine, things like that. But it's not quite the same. The difference is the scale. In Google App Engine, you upload the entire application. And these are byte chunk sizes of code functions that are encapsulated and that you can deploy independently and you can scale them independently. And that's, it's a very, that is the main, the root difference, because imagine that you have an endpoint that has a lot of load, for example, that is transcoding some files, and another endpoint that only during some peaks of the day, for example, an, an API, it has the load. If you have uh, functions as a service, you can scale your functions to meet your needs. So the main idea, the main difference is the elasticity that you get using that. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about two kind of uh, scenarios. The first of all is what I, am, I have called a hosted solutions. Hosted solutions means that there is a cloud provider, for example, AWS, Amazon Web Services, that gives you that functionality. So you just have to upload your code, uh, configure it, and it's the responsibility of the cloud to host it, scale it, manage it. And in the second part, I'm going to introduce some do-it-yourself solutions. That means you have to host the infrastructure, and to a certain extent, you have to manage it. But it's not the same kind of management that you have with traditional infrastructure. and on the contrary, you get, uh, you get less uh, vendor locking, and you are much more free to experiment it in a local environment uh, at first. So speaking about hosted solutions, the first of all, the pioneer is AWS Lambda. I don't know how many of you know AWS, Amazon Web Services. Well, many of you. There's a, it's like a collection of Lego blocks that helps you building uh, applications on the cloud. They give you everything you need. They give you uh, computing power, like EC2. They give you databases. They give you object storage, like the buckets of S3, notification queues, voice recognition, like uh, with Lex or even Alexa. You get logs, streams, emails. And you have to connect and configure those pieces in order to have your application. Uh, one new application that uh, appeared in 2014 is called AWS Lambda. And it's the function as a service uh, 
functionality of AWS. It means that it's like a glue service that is triggered by another service and can give the results that could, uh, on, on turn, serve as the input of, uh, to another of the AWS services. For example, you could, you could uh, configure a trigger so that every time you upload a new file to an S3 bucket, then AWS Lambda processes that file and, for example, uh, creates and stores the new process file in another different bucket. Or you could use the API Gateway, that is a service that routes your requests into other services in AWS and pass your request to AWS Lambda. You can get your responses as an HTTP response back, or you can uh, use it any other of the event sources in AWS. AWS also, and this is important, builds you by the usage of your function. Uh, and the usage is computed basically by the time of your execution, your execution time and the amount of RAM that you are devoting to your functions. So if you are not running your functions, you are not being built. And the, it has a free tire that is very interesting. If you are a developer and want just to play around with it, you get one million invocations per month and uh, four, 400,000 gigabit second of uh, compute time. So you can just create an account and play with it. And it would be quite difficult if you get built by the usage of these resources. If you use other resources like S3, then you get built. It's, maybe it's not very clear, this resolution, but AWS Lambda has limits. It's not a silver bullet. You cannot do everything you want, although you can do it, or you can do many things, sometimes using some workarounds. One of the main limitations is the amount of RAM. You start with 128 megs and get a maximum of 151.5 gigabytes. And uh, you do not have a great amount of storage, and you cannot rely on local storage in the, in the instance that is being deployed. Uh, by contrary, you need to rely on other services to store uh, that information. For example, you could use uh, some databases in AWS, DynamoDB, or you could use S3 if you need to store uh, the results of your execution or some other information. And you have a limit of five minutes of execution time. So if you need to do things that uh, take more than five minutes, you have to split them and make something like a pipeline in order to overcome this uh, limitation. Another important thing is that your dependencies zipped cannot be more than 250 megabytes, so you cannot put everything you want. And there are other limits th that sometimes can be changed. For example, the concurrency limit that by default is 1,000 executions simultaneously, but that speaking with AWS, you can increase it. And well, let's, let's say that we have overcome these limits. We have planned our function. What do I have to do to implement a function? Imagine that we have a module. We have our hello.py file. And then we define uh, inside a handler. A handler is a function with this signature. It receives an event and a context object. The event is a dictionary-like uh, structure that has information about the input event for example, the parameters that have been called with it. And the context is another object that has information about the runtime, for example, the remaining time that we have for the execution or the amount of RAM that we have uh, stored. So if we respect this signature, we can then, for example, get the first and last name that could be as uh, input parameters inside the event and construct a JSON dictionary-like uh, message and return it back. So in the context object, what I was talking, we can get the remaining time of executions and some other information, including the amount of RAM that we have available. And depending on the AWS configuration, some resources as the log group or information about the customer. If we have that hello.py file, what can we do to upload it? We can do manually in the console of AWS, but we could also use the command line interface and the create function. 
we have to pick a name for our function. We have to say that the hello.py, hello underscore python.py is the name of the module, and this is the handler. And we have to package our dependencies. In this case, for example, we do not have any external dependencies, but if not, we should copy the contents of the site packages and these packages of the virtual length into a zip file and upload it. We have to specify a role, which is a, a way in Amazon the, to give permissions to some uh, execution. Uh, in this case, we need at least to give Lambda execution permissions. And finally, specify the runtime. In Lambda, we can use Node.js, we can use C Sharp, Java, and Python 2.7, and Python 3.6. That is what we have chosen. And finally, the timeout and the memory size. We can then, once we have uploaded it and we have a new URL, which is the function ARN, we can invoke it. And invoking it means using, for example, the AWS CLI and passing the payload for the event. Then we can get a JSON response and see that it is working. In the repo, we have many, we have this uh, example detailed and how to, for example, plug an API gateway uh, in front of it so that we can have an HTTP request in, instead of uh, invoking it manually. Some uh, advice on testing your AWS Lambda functions could be decouple the business logic from the signature of the, of the function so that if you have a pure function that do not rely on events or something that AWS related, you can test it much more easily. You can use some sample events that are available on the console or on the CLI. And you can use uh, people from LANCI has created a collection of containers that are called Lambda, that uh, mimic the environment that you will find in Lambda. So you can uh, locally do some simulations and test uh, with the versions of the software that it is, it is installed. But it's not easy to make those packages and load them and manage the life cycle. So there are many frameworks available for doing and making your life easier. One of them is Chalice. Chalice is a micro framework for managing the Lambda functions and the API gateway also. It is Flask-like. You may see the code, and it's similar to the Flask API. And also, it incorporates a CLI that creates and configures your AWS resources for you. And it means the, uh, not only the Lambda functions, but the API gateway, the IIM roles, and also package the code package the code in the requirements, and upload them, uploads them. And it's officially supported by AWS. It could be some, something simple like this. We install it, create a new project, then we will have an app.py file that also has some code example, and we can create an example using a Flask-like syntax, but using Chalice in, instead of Flask, and create our function to root the request and get the JSON body and construct the dictionary-like object. And using the command chalice deploy, we can upload it, and we will have the URL of the API gateway to start testing it. There's another framework uh, that yesterday in the, in the Lightning Talks, uh, Matthias introduced, that is called Zappa. It's much more advanced, and it basically takes your WSGI application and upload it to AWS. It does not matter if it's Django, if it's Flask, or any other that has a WSGI interface. And it also is it's the more complex and advanced framework that I've found because it manages the life cycle. It can do some rollbacks, it can do some uh, rolling release, it can, you can test it locally, you can get remotely the logs, and has some features that are not available like remote invocations, you can schedule the configuration using a cron-like syntax and doing some async executions. And one thing that yesterday was left to be told is that it can keep your functions warm. It means that it can schedule another function that calls your function so that the load time, the cold uh, start latency, is less than that, the one you would get if you manually just called it, because the first time that you call a Lambda functions, it may take some, f some seconds to do the startup, and then you, using that, you will avoid it. 
This is a use case in Carto where we, uh, we work. We, we are doing some analysis using NumPy and Matplotlib, and they are done using an external AWS Lambda resource that is being called from the pop-up, and uh, a binary image is returned so that we can inject it in the, in the map. Another hosted solutions could be using Azure Functions, IBM Cloud, uh, cloud uh, Bluemix Cloud Functions, Iron.io, and at the time of the, the research, Google Cloud Function does, did not yet support Python. I don't know exactly now. And now we'll have a brief view of the do-it-yourself uh, alternatives. We can use Iron Functions, that is free software that is based on Docker containers. So it uses the standard input and standard output as the mechanism of input and output for your Lambda functions. Uh, it uses images from the Docker Hub, and the idea is to have a YAML file uh, describing your function and the entry point, so that with the CLI you can create your containers, push it, create apps, and create routes. In the repo, you will have instructions and uh, ways to mm, play with it. This could be the code, and we are just reading from the standard output and printing to the standard reading from the standard input and printing to the standard output. Apache OpenWhisk is another alternative, much more complex. It uses console, Nginx, Kafka, and it really embraces a programming philosophy using triggers, rules, and actions. And it has support directly out of the box for the Python 3 uh, framework, so you just can create your function with, the, with your .py file. And uh, this is uh, a very interesting option. It's called OpenFast. You will have to deploy a Docker Swarm or Kubernetes cluster, and it uses it to run the containers for the functions. And one of the main uh, benefits of it is that it can auto-scale. It can create new replicas of your service to meet the concurrency demand, which is a good idea. It is written by Alex Ellis. Uh, it was the winner of the DockerCon 2017 Cool Hacks contest and it's a good idea and evolving very fastly. And at last, uh, at last, there's another alternative based on Kubernetes called Fission. Fission is similar to other alternatives that we have seen. It uses Flask directly, so you just import it and use it in your code. And one difference is that it has a pool of uh, containers that are live and injects the function into them so that you can get a uh, cold start latency as low as 100 milliseconds, and you can also use, uh, upload it, upload your code using um, a CLI interface. So the idea of, the, of that was not to go into deeper details of what is serverless, but to present you many alternatives using AWS, but also using some homebrew solutions to play with it, experiment with the concept, and in the repo that you have it, uh, you can just uh, play with the examples and maybe learn a little bit more of that. So I hope that you have enjoyed this brief introduction and now it's time for the questions. Do you have any questions? Puedo preguntar en castellano, ¿no? ¿Vale? Eh, sí, o sea, muy guay, muchas gracias. Una de las cosas que se suele comentar con el serverless es que el servidor es problema de otra persona. Eso está muy bien. Eh, cuando te montas tú la infraestructura, de repente te tienes que ocupar, al final tienes la máquina levantada todo el rato con tu FAS eh, on-premise. Entonces, ¿cuál es la ventaja ahí de, de tener, aparte del vendor locking? ¿Qué es lo que consigues en, en términos de, pues de, de potencia o de versatilidad? Bueno, eh, al final es sobre todo quizá un tema económico también. El, si Lambda no es algo que sea demasiado caro, si lo hospedas tú en tu propio clúster de máquinas, pues seguramente sea más barato incluso. Otra cosa es además que quieras engancharlo con muchos servicios internos, que es algo que desde Lambda es complicado, porque tienes que salir de AWS para poder acceder a ellos. Y el tema de los permisos es de las cosas que llevan más tiempo en configuración y demás. Si lo estás corriendo en tu propia infraestructura, podrás tener acceso a cosas que no están publicadas en Internet, por ejemplo, mucho más fácil. 
Además, la gestión de máquinas, cuando, todos estos están basados en containers. Y cuando tienes un clúster de orquestación de containers, no es tanta preocupación. El software es homogéneo. Básicamente, en el servidor lo que ha instalado es Docker y poco más. No tienes que estar gestionando las versiones. Eso va todo dentro de los containers. O sea, que es una carga, pero no es tanta carga como la de la gestión tradicional de máquinas. More questions? Oh, okay. Thank you very much.